ओम ज्ञान तिरंधस्य ज्ञानं जनसमाकर चक्षुर नीलितम ये न तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः बट टुडे वी शुड बी रीडिंग फ्रॉम वर्स 12 ट्रांसलेशन एंड कमेंट्री बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस AC Bhakti Vedant Swami Prabhupada Translation When the city was set ablaze all the citizens and servants of the king as well as all family members sons grandsons wives and other relatives were within the fire King Puranjan thus became very unhappy Purport there are many parts of the body the senses the limbs the skin the muscles blood marrow etc and all these are considered here figuratively as sons grandsons citizens and dependents <clears throat> when the body is attacked by the vishnu dwara the fiery condition becomes so acute that sometimes one remains in a coma this means that the body is in such severe pain that one becomes unconscious and cannot feel the miseries taking place within the body indeed the living entity becomes so helpless at the time of death that although unwilling he is forced to give up the body and enter another in bhagavad gita it is stated that man may by scientific advancement improve the temporary living conditions but that he cannot avoid the pangs of birth old age disease and death These are under the control of the supreme personality of Godhead through the agency of material nature. A foolish person cannot understand this simple fact. Now people are very busy trying to find petroleum in the midst of the ocean. They are very anxious to make provisions for the future petroleum supply, but they do not make any attempts to ameliorate the conditions of birth, old age, disease and death. Thus a person in ignorance not knowing anything about his own future life is certainly defeated in all his activities continuing the figurative description of the life of Maharaj Puranja the life means the death because jatasya hi dhruva mrityu for one who is born death is sir shila prabhupada here refers to a coma the condition of coma he says that the that the <coughs> condition of coma comes about when the pain is so severe that one becomes unconscious elsewhere shila prabhupada remarked that people who are extremely sinful they go into coma because the demigods are trying to work out where to send him it's a, what kind of punishment is fit for him interestingly uh, some useless fact to spice up the presentation of shrimad bhagavatam here today happens to be the death anniversary Well it's the disappearance anniversary of Ramachandra Kaviraj but according to the Gregorian calendar today is the death anniversary of Sir Winston Churchill which all of you ignorant people don't know about you don't know about this very important person who was great hero of the British empire of course he had to witness the British empire being dismembered who happened to die after a long coma he was extremely sinful uh, i've heard it said that he was shrila prabhupada said he was the biggest demon of this of the second world war he had a pretty good competition there with stalin and hitler hitler is generally considered to be the most sinful anyway uh, shrila prabhupada did sometimes discuss these points so there's a little bit of uh, modern history thrown in for good measure Churchill died in a coma. He's cons- it's interesting how the history is. History means propaganda. Materialistic history means propaganda. That's I, when I was in that 
extremely horrible place called school, for which it's for which it's it's worth practicing. I mean, even apart from the fact that Krishna is all blissful and all perfect, and we all have our relationship with him, it's worth getting out of this material world just so you don't have to go back to school again. So, uh, in the school, we studied history, and of course. History means British history, because I was in Britain, and there's no doubt about it, Britain is the most important country in the world for everyone who lives in Britain, that's what they think. And probably everyone who lives in Iceland thinks that Iceland is the most important country in the world. But anyway, it was, I mean, clearly, even at that young age, it was quite understandable that it was simply propaganda. Because it, it showed the British to be all glorious, and the French... The perennial enemies of the British, their friends now, I think, but uh, how stupid and useless they are, and how we always smash them, and so on and so on. It's all propaganda. In Pakistan, I don't know about now, but uh, in Pakistan, the, the English newspaper in Karachi, Dawn, it's called Dawn newspaper. So, you're from Pakistan? No. Even if you are, you can't say. There are so many Hindus from Pakistan living in India, and Muslims too. So, uh, yeah, so in the uh, paper they refer to India, they, they simply state the enemy. That's all. In a history of uh, Pakistan, no, it's a book I read when I was in Bangladesh. It was this university textbook called a history of Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India, put in order of importance of the countries. This was a book published in Bangladesh. So they recounted how uh, Aurangzeb was a great person, very good person, and this Akbar was completely useless, compromising with all the Hindus. So it's all subjective. Fortunately, we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, which gives... Ob an objective view of reality. That means Krishna's subjective view. What Krishna says, that is correct. And actually, as Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, Janma Mrityu Jaravya Adhi Dukha Doshanu Darshanam Dukha Doshanu Darshanam the, the, the miseries of birth, de birth, death, old age and disease are miserable. He says that one who sees this through the system of parampara, such a, that is one of the symptoms of a person in knowledge. Now this is not a scriptural statement which one has to accept. One is obliged if one is a member of a sectarian religious institution, one is obliged to accept it on faith. You have to believe in the blood of Jesus. Otherwise you burn in hell forever. So we are told. Whatever it, I have no idea what it means to believe in the blood of Jesus. And I don't think it was ever explained to me. But I spent the first 12 years or so of my life in fear of burning in hell forever if I didn't believe in the blood of Jesus until I got intelligent enough to understand it was just a bunch of bunkum and not worth believing in. Because what does it mean? No one defines it. They just tell you you have to believe in it. So, all right, we believe there's such a thing as the blood of Jesus, but what does it mean? You have to bathe yourself in the blood of Jesus. Well, what does that mean? It's, this is uh, sectarian, religion, ignorance. What Krishna says is uh, objectively verifiable by any person. Who is not, uh, yeah, well, if they're, they have to be objective, they have to be not biased by the uh, tamasic religious propaganda that's been pumped into them. So, Janma Mrityu Jaraviyadhi, these are facts. Birth, death, old age, and disease, these are facts of the material world. That everyone, this is suffering, and everyone has to suffer. It doesn't matter what you believe, you can be a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, 
atheists. You might even believe, as some people believe, that nothing really exists. You might believe that all of reality is just a projection of my consciousness, that's all that actually exists. There are so many strange theories in the world, but whatever your theory or belief or imagination may be, it is a fact that everyone has to suffer, birth, death, old age and disease. And one may say, well, I am God, I am in control of everything. <laughs> you can, there, are, there are many fools in the world who directly think this. They, they actually believe that they are in control. But, despite their imagination, confabulation, they are forced to suffer birth, death, old age and disease. And even if you believe that nothing exists except the, except my consciousness, I'm not conscious of anything else. I don't know if anyone, I, I don't believe that anyone else has consciousness or even existence. You may think like that, but every, as Srila Prabhupada always made this point, that we are forced to suffer birth, death, old age and disease. Srila Prabhupada presented the philosophy of Krishna consciousness all over the world in a scientific manner. He always said this is a science. Science means that it's verifiable and at the, at the uh, lower stages uh, the teachings of Bhagavad Gita are verifiable. At the higher stages that has to be accepted on faith. But the very fact that, that, that the supreme controller is a cowherd boy with a flute, that is not uh, deducible by material intelligence or observable through the senses. But that such statements are preceded in the Vedic didactic process, to use a fancy word, uh, by statements that are compellingly real and true for everyone, suggests that Vyasa Dev uh, didn't hover between writing uh, compelling facts of the material world and writing some imagination, some fairy stories. The Janmam Ritu Jaravyadhi, everyone has to suffer this. Srila Prabhupada, his scientific presentation <coughs> of Krishna consciousness all over the world among people who don't have faith in Bhagavad Gita. In India, at least among Hindus, uh, we can to a large extent, present Krishna consciousness and tell people that, well, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says this, Krishna says that, and people, although they don't really know why, but they, due to sentiment of myself being a Hindu, they tend to accept it that Bhagavad Gita is authoritative. But outside the Hindu community, and especially in the, the Western world where the uh, materialistic scientific stranglehold is uh, in some ways much more comprehensive even than in India. If, if we simply go and say, well, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says this, so people, are, they, don't, they don't put any, uh, they don't give any worth to that. What do they care about Bhagavad Gita? They don't even care about the Bible, which is supposed to be their own traditional religious authority. Most people don't care. And those who do care about the Bible, they certainly want to, they're not liable to accept, the, the most of them are not liable to accept the Bhagavad Gita. Or even if they were, they would want to measure it in terms of the Bible. So 
Practically to preach Krishna consciousness in the Western world requires a scientific approach. Now, by this, I don't mean only the BI approach, or the, that of uh, what would be called advanced science. But it requires a presentation in a manner that, at least the philosophic part, of course there have to be festivals, Harinam, public Harinam, distribution of prasadam, but in presenting the, uh, what people would consider to be the philosophy or the concepts of Krishna consciousness, which we, who have committed ourselves to it, accept as ultimate reality, absolute truth, but other people see it as one path among many. So to convince them that this is the path of all auspiciousness, the actual path that everyone should adopt for their own best welfare uh, requires, outside of the Hindu ethos, it requires a scientific or intelligent presentation. So as I see it, or as, as I have analyzed, Srila Prabhupada's preaching in the Western world was on the basis of the truth spoken in Bhagavad Gita in a scientific manner. Krishna himself presents in a scientific way, but Srila Prabhupada, without even mentioning Bhagavad Gita, would stress these two points. One is that we are not the body. The body is temporary. The body is material but we, the living being, are intrinsically different from the body, which of course is Krishna's teaching in Bhagavad Gita. But Srila Prabhupada would establish that, actually using the examples in Bhagavad Gita of the body is changing, the person remains the same, a five-year-old boy is the same as uh, his body changes, he becomes gradually an 85-year-old man. The body has changed totally. Probably all this, every single atom in the body of the 5-year-old boy has, is no longer in the body of an 85-year-old man. The mind has also changed. The mind is changing at every moment. And the overall mentality of an 85-year-old man is significantly different from that of a 5-year-old boy even though it's the same person. So Srila Prabhupada would point out that considering that the mind and body are constantly changing, but that the person remains constant, it is uh, clear from this that the person is different from the body and the mind. So that's a scientific presentation. That's actually what Krishna presents this in Bhagavad Gita. Srila Prabhupada extrapolated Dehino svinyata dehe komaram yovanam jara tata dehantara praptihi. Srila Prabhupada built on this example to show how the uh, soul is different from the body. Then another point Srila Prabhupada uh, repeatedly made among people who were uh, uh, unacquainted with the philosophy of Krishna consciousness or Bhagavad Gita, uh, not necessarily challenging people, but uh, simply ignorant. Srila Prabhupada would point out that we are all controlled. No one wants to die, but we are forced to die. No one wants to be unhappy. We, it is forced upon us. No one wants old age. It is forced upon us. No one wants to be diseased. Now, amazingly enough, some people would argue with this. People, they have the tendency of not wanting to accept any authority. But Srila Prabhupada, he, was, he wasn't invoking his authority in order to present this message. Someone, a guru may say to his disciple, oh, you should accept this. Because I'm telling you, on my authority, one is ex expected to accept the Guru's words 
on his authority. Of course, a real guru won't say, well, I said this, therefore you have to accept it, but a real guru will explain with reference to Shastra. But, uh, what's that term? Prima facie. That one should accept it, one should accept what the guru says, even if one doesn't understand it, one should tentative, tentatively accept it. And then one may ask the guru to explain, I didn't understand that. This is what's going on in Bhagavad Gita. The, or even Arjuna, he, he didn't fully accept, but he didn't reject out of hand anything that Krishna said. And though he didn't understand, Krishna explained it more. But uh, in the Western world, it's very strongly the theory that everyone should have their own opinion and you, should, you shouldn't accept anyone's authority. And everyone's entitled to have their own idea. So Srila Prabhupada, he didn't preach in the manner that, well, I'm saying this and I'm an authority on Bhagavad Gita, so you should accept it. He didn't say that. Because why would people... May if people were willing to learn Bhagavad Gita, they might accept it. But they may say, oh, that's very good. Well, you're an authority on Bhagavad Gita. All right, but I don't have to accept it. But Srila Prabhupada made the point that you do have to accept birth, death, old age and disease. It's not, it's not my opinion. You may have your own opinion according to the modern... It's not only modern. It's always there in human society but it's quite prominent at the present time. Everyone is entitled to their opinion, this rubbish idea. But the, that one has to accept birth, death, old age and disease is not an opinion. Well, in my opinion, I'm not going to get old. You can have your opinion, but it's nonsense. It's stupid. In my opinion, two plus two equals five. Well, it's a free country, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're a damn fool. Two plus two never equals five. So, certain facts are indisputable. I mean, you may dispute them, but it just reveals your ignorance. So, Srila Prabhupada, he made the point that we are controlled, which means there is a controller. You cannot dispute that we are. There is a force stronger than us, which we cannot. That no one in the history of the world has been able to defy this force by yoga exercises or taking certain medicines. One may attempt to delay the onset of old age, or one may try to ameliorate the influence. But the fact is that everyone has to get old. Of course, one may have a premature death, but that's not really a solution. <laughs> because old age is uh, that which precedes death. Which is an, that, is the, the, uh, that is absolutely unavoidable. Therefore, the saying is, as sure as death. What could be more sure than death? There's no one in history it's never been observed nor is it expected that anyone can escape death of course there are foolish people who think that they can do that I saw a book on someone had written a book some woman from America had written a book called I can't remember exactly the title, but it was to the... The theme was, How to Live Forever. It wasn't a religious book. It, meant, it means in the, in the body. So by massage and exercises and herbs and Reiki, I was quite confident she was going to live forever. He's a fool. Another fool. <laughs> Hiranyakashipu wanted to live forever. Another fool. <laughs> All fools. Of course, you can live forever. And that is 
the message of Bhagavad Gita. Again, coming from the perspective of the Western world, uh, there's a general idea that Indic religions, in other words, those coming from India, are pessimistic. Indic religions means Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, particularly. They're pessimistic because they're, they're always thinking of this birth, death, old age and disease. The world is miserable. You have to renounce it. In the higher level, you have to renounce it. But actually, that's a misunderstanding. It's uh, teachings of Bhagavad Gita are very hopeful. Even this story of Puranjan, which uh, ends in the death of Puranjan, the miserable death. Miserable death means... Death is miserable. But actually the over it's this story is within the context of a broader story in which although Puranjan doesn't live happily ever after, Prachina Barhishat, by hearing this story, gets the information and the inspiration by which he can live forever. Not in the body. That's a curse. You ask some old person if they want to live forever in that particular body which is suffering so much. That's, the, that's not a blessing. To be in a, a miserable body in which to, to do anything is simply painful and troublesome. That's not a blessing. Uh, so to, to be... To live forever could be considered a curse. There, there are many old people who, who are, are people in pain who welcome death as a release from the suffering that they're in. But to live forever in complete bliss in the service of Krishna, that's the ultimate message of this story. It's not, it may seem like a a grim and nasty narration, but, and it is, because the material world is grim and nasty, but this is to show our, to demonstrate what is our present situation, and not just to leave it there, okay, it's miserable, it's horrible, just get out of it. That's what the Mayavadis and the Buddhists, they, they come to the conclusion that the perfection is just switch off, get out. But the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam, give a highly optimistic message that parastasmatu bhava nyo vyakto vyaktat sanatanaha beyond this material world which is always created and destroyed again and again and again, there is the spiritual world of pure bliss no old age, no disease, no death, no rebirth. That is the that is the message that's being pointed toward. So this uh, clear perception of the miseries of birth and birth, death, old age, and disease, Janma Mrityu Jaravyadhi, Dukkha Doshanu Darshanam. This is mentioned by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita as one of the symptoms of a person who's actually in knowledge. And actually many of the other points mentioned there. Amanitvam, Adhambitvam. These, uh, this lack of pride, lack of the desire for prestige, uh, they all come naturally to a person who understands our actual existential position. Why should one be proud of anything in this world. I, I am a crop pattern. I am an expert, whatever you might be expert in. And even if, if someone is a little bit better than someone else in doing anything else, they, te they tend to be proud of that. I'm better than you. But 
What is the meaning of that when we're such tiny, insignificant beings subject to death? So if one understands that, that nothing in this world is of any meaning, then naturally he, he doesn't hanker for being honored by others. He doesn't become proud of his abilities. So this basic knowledge of what we are not, we are not anything of this world, is the foundation for receiving the knowledge of the spiritual world. The knowledge of the material world, that is the knowledge of the material world that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. These important facts, basic facts of the miseries of birth, death, old age and disease, of the fact that we are controlled, we are not as we foolishly think, the controller. These are uh, verifiable by anyone who has any slight intelligence. The problem is that everyone in this world is foolish. Krishna gives the knowledge by which it's not just information, the knowledge that Krishna gives, but it gives intelligence also. Informa you can pack so much information just in your head, just like a donkey packs on the, so many bricks are packed on the packed on the back of a donkey. So one may stuff so much information into the mind and still be stupid. Vidara Vilase, this Bhaktino Thako sings that by the pastimes of study, he became an ass. He considers well, I shouldn't say that. He said that I became like an ass by amassing much information. So simply to amass information doesn't make one intelligent. It means that one can be a, a more sophisticated fool or a learned fool. But Krishna, the knowledge that Krishna gives is intelligence giving. It, it, it's not simply information, but it gives the perspective by which we can see everything else clearly. That verse I said yesterday, what is that? Gyanam geyam, hmm? Again, I forgot it. Gyanam geyam to agyanam yesham nashitam atmanaha tesham prakashyati tatparam. How does it begin? Jnanam gyayam tadak jnanam. That's it. So when one is enlightened by the knowledge by which ignorance is destroyed, then everything is revealed just like the sun rising in the sky. With a torchlight you can look and see a few things. But one cannot get a very clear understanding of what anything is with a, with a flashlight. But when the sun arises, then without any extra effort, one can see everything very clearly. So Krishna gives this knowledge by which everything becomes clear. Everything is clearly understood. And then, uh, having clearly understood this, one can uh, become enlightened with that knowledge which is not verifiable by material means. I mean spiritual knowledge. The, the knowledge of the miseries of birth, death, old, and disease, old age and disease is not actually spiritual knowledge. It's material knowledge, but it is preliminary to and essential to spiritual knowledge. The fact that we get old, the fact that we die, the fact that we have suffer old age and rebirth, this is knowledge of the material situation, and that is miserable. So it's material knowledge, you could say, is on the borderline between material and spiritual. But it is that knowledge which, if properly received, prepares us to receive the knowledge of the spiritual reality of our relationship with Krishna who is that supreme controller by 
whose agencies, not directly, but by whose agency, the material nature, we are controlled within this material world. So, uh, this knowledge is essential to understand, but it can, it's not understandable simply by an academic method. One cannot perceive that birth, death, old age and disease are miserable if one is still trying to enjoy it. Because then will, one will, th it means the opposite mentality, instead of thinking birth, death, old age and disease are miserable, we will try to, persons who are trying to enjoy this material world, they try to minimize this discussion. They don't like to think about it, or they think, well, anyway it has to happen, but let's enjoy ourselves as much as we can in the, mean, in the meantime. So, uh, in spiritual culture, to fully receive and absorb and realize this knowledge, one is required to practice forcible detachment from sense enjoyment. Forcible means that one uh, takes upon oneself to practice detachment from this material world. Just like we have in our movement, minimum austerity, no meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex, no intoxication. If anyone engages in any of these activities, he cannot understand that this material world is miserable because these are activities meant for grossly enjoying the material world. And then uh, because this, such acti activities of sense gratification, they are fuel for the fire of material desire, which burns like fire, dushparena analena cha. And that's one example Krishna gives about material desire. It burns like a fire in the heart. And another example he gives is that it, material desire covers real knowledge. So, if one is engaging in sense gratification, then one cannot understand, although it's so obvious and so apparent and all around us, that material life is miserable. One cannot understand it. One's understanding becomes completely warped. And therefore, as Yudhishthya Maharaj pointed out, Ahane Ahane Bhutani Gachanti Hayamalayam Shesha Tavara Ichanti Kimas Charya Atafparam Yudhishthya Maharaj pointed out that what could be, as figuratively, what is it, rhetorically speaking, what could be more amazing than this? That every day so many living beings uh, make a journey to the place of Yamaraj. In other words, they die. But those who, are, who haven't this time round yet died, in other words, those who are still alive, they desire to stay forever. What could be more amazing than this? Then everyone sees people die not just humans, but all kinds of living beings dying all around you all the time. And we think that we'll just go on with our life. We, with the enormity of the fact that we are also about to die, it doesn't strike us. Why is that? Because we're so much concerned with enjoying this world due to material desire, which is the enemy of the conditioned soul. People say that well, I'm happy. You see, I have nice food, nice wife, nice house, nice dog, everything nice. But uh, they don't see that that modicum of happiness, that is their enemy. Because that conditions them, conditions them, I say conditions them, that conditions them to think that I'm happy, and birth, death, old age and disease, they're not that serious, or if anyway, don't think about it too much. The fact of this terrible, terrible situation, that we have to suffer birth, death, old age and disease, we become numbed to that, because 
we like to eat some chips from a plastic packet, etc. Or more extreme forms of happiness. Yehi sang sparsha ja bhoga The the happiness which comes of the touch of one body to another, the touch of a male body to a female body, gives such an such an experience of pleasure that the extreme uh, displeasure or pain that one has to suffer in birth, death, old age and disease, we don't consider it. So it acts like, this will be described in the next canto, how this, the desire for sense enjoyment, especially sex enjoyment, it acts like a whirlwind which blows up all dust to cover our consciousness by which we can't see the actual fact of the miseries in which we are actually plunged. There are so many examples. It's just like someone is driving in a car very fast and up ahead there's a big mountain. So you're driving right into a wall of rock. You're going straight at it full speed. But there's some distance to go yet. There's still half a kilometer. So you still have like one minute before you hit the rock. And in the meantime, you think, well, let me adjust my seat so that I'm comfortable. Adjust the air conditioner and play some nice music. But you've got to smash into the rock. But, well, anyway, you still have some time. You can listen to the... Listen to the football commentary on the radio, or cricket if you're in India. Listen to the cricket commentary on the radio and I install this nice new air conditioner. Might as well enjoy it because I want, I'm going to see, there's a rock up ahead. I just installed this new air conditioner so I should enjoy it because I, I won't be able to enjoy it after I smash into the rock. So I better enjoy it while I can. This is madness. This is our situation which Narada Muni is pointing out to Prachina Barhishat. So, uh, the, story, we, the story can live, the story can end happily, but we have to keep on reading. Right now, it's a grim situation. We're stuck in the world of birth and death. But it does get better, and it can get better, if we go on listening to Narada Muni. In the meantime, if we think, well, that was a good horror story. Now let's find out another story. The people, they may, they may read Bhagavad Gita. Stephen Covey, one of the great gurus of the modern age, means he's a, what is that called? Lifestyle guru in the Western world. They, he has recommended that one should read uplifting literature. And he gives us an example, Bhagavad Gita. So yes, you can read Bhagavad Gita and you can read something else uplifting like the Iliad or Paradise Lost or Alice in Wonderland and this is uplifting literature. So you read Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, okay, very good. I read it. Okay, what's the next book I'm going to read? But not like that. The message of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam is not just a mental diversion. It's uh, an outline of reality which we we need to live with it. We have to enter the story. Right now we're all in the story. We are also in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Who are the great heroes of Srimad Bhagavatam? Krishna, obviously. Then we have Ambarish, Prahalad, Narada Muni. We're all in the Srimad Bhagavatam also. Just like today's verse. When the city was set ablaze, all the citizens and servants of the king, as well as all family members, sons, grandsons, wives and other relatives, were within the fire. King Puranjan thus became very unhappy. So we're all King Puranjan. By another name. But, by the grace of Narada Muni, we can, by the grace of Narad Muni, we can come out of this hell of material life 
and go to Krishna. Narad Muni is pointing Prachina Barhishat toward Krishna. That's what he ultimately wants to do. But first it has to be pointed out to him that don't stay here. Don't think you're happy here. Any question? Maybe I'll take one question and stop. Yes. The mic. Is that the same idea of I'm okay, you're okay, I'm okay, you're okay. Is that the same idea as? Everything's okay, don't criticize anything. Yeah, well there was a book called I'm Okay, You're Okay that was popular. A major bestseller while Srila Prabhupada was present in the world and Srila Prabhupada said that is not our philosophy. Our philosophy is I'm okay, you're not okay. <laughs> I'm okay because we follow Bhagavad Gita by Krishna's grace and you're not okay if you don't follow Bhagavad Gita. So, not to criticize anyone, well, yeah, we should. We should criticize as Narada Muni is criticizing, with the aim of uplifting, not to smash others down, but to point out that, my dear sir, you are very comfortable in your car, but there is a rock up ahead and you'd better change course. Don't stop to enjoy the air conditioning. Hare Krishna.